Grant County is officially under a red flag warning for tomorrow. The National Weather Service says a combination of hot, hot temperatures, high wind and low humidity could spark explosive fire growth starting Saturday at noon and then lasting through the evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here for Creme 2 News First at 4. I'm Whitney Ward, joined, of course, by Tom <laughs> Sherry in the Creme 2 studios. And Tom, we want to start right with you tonight because we know that this warm up is coming. It's going to be kind of a short lived but intense warm up, it sounds like. Absolutely. We're going to see temperatures at 90 degrees here in the Spokane area and we're going to see temperatures get well over 90 in the lower Columbia Basin. And of course, where that red flag warning is in effect right now, high pressure building across the northwest. You see all the cloud cover now moving up to the Gulf of Alaska. We've got clear skies across the area. 77 degrees. Wind is out of the southwest right now at 13 miles per hour. We take a look at your day planner forecast. Again, a beautiful evening right now with an overnight low of 55. Sunny and hot on Saturday. Look for a daytime high of 90. Some wind gusts up to 20 miles per hour on Saturday, and it will be blowing even more in areas of central and lower central Washington. And then it looks like we're going to be seeing te temperatures drop all the way down to 77 on Sunday as a cool front moves in. So we're going to have a lot of wind moving in for Sunday as well. Of course, if we spark a fire, a lot of wind will keep that thing going. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Nothing like that happens. I'll have a look at your seven day forecast coming up in a few minutes. Thank you, Tom, and also a heads up that if you are planning on traveling this weekend on the I-90 Vantage Bridge, you at least want to expect some delays or a plan for a little extra time. Right now, WashDOT is repairing a three by five foot hole in the right eastbound lane of the bridge. So WashDOT says that right lane will remain closed until Sunday morning. So if you're going to be headed in that direction, expect traffic delays. If possible, WashDOT wants you to just avoid that area completely or at least travel later at night or earlier in the day. And then, of course, please slow down and watch out for those work crews. We are learning more tonight about a Spokane police officer who has now been charged with vehicular assault. This is after a crash that actually happened several months ago. Mark Hanrahan is joining us now with the details about what we know so far and what both sides are saying tonight. Mark. Hey, good afternoon, Whitney. The victim's lawyer claims officers initially tried to cover it up and even tried to blame the victim. Well, today police are responding to say that's simply not true. So here's what we know about the crash. It happened back on March 25th, just before seven o'clock in the morning. Two officers in separate cars were heading north on Lincoln Street and getting impatient with the civilian driver in front of them. That's according to the officer not involved in the crash. Then the street became two lanes. That civilian driver moved over to the right lane, and that's when Officer Brunner picked up speed to pass. Meantime, the two victims who were in a small SUV were going west on 5th and started to cross Lincoln, and that's when Brunner slammed into them. Now, data recorded on his car showed at one point he was traveling at 65 miles per hour. The speed limit on that section of Lincoln is 30. Officer Brunner did break, but collided with the victim's car doing 32. Well, now a lawyer for the victim claims that immediately after the crash, the officers tried covering it up by blaming the victim, even issuing that driver a ticket. And he claims it was only after it became obvious that that wouldn't fly. The WSP was brought in, the ticket revoked and Brunner charged. Now, a spokesperson for Spokane Police denies the accusations. They say the ticket was issued to the driver after other officers determined that officer did have the right of way. However, when data showed speed played a role, the case was forwarded to an outside agency to investigate. During that investigation, police dropped the ticket for the driver and placed the officer on leave. This was all within a few days of that March 25th accident. The spokesperson adds, clearly SPD would not ask an outside agency to look into the action of the officer if it were trying to cover something up. That officer, by the way, scheduled to make his first court appearance on July 15th. We will continue to follow this story and for updates, just head to creme.com. Back to you. All right, Mark, thank you very much. Well, today, uh, crews will continue working to recover the wreckage from that mid-air plane collision over Lake Coeur d'Alene. Take a look at the latest video now. The Kootenai County Sheriff's Office brought in a barge and a crane to collect those two planes that have been under 127 feet of water. Last night, crews did recover the eighth and final victim. They also recovered the fuselage of the Cessna aircraft. The seaplane wreckage, though, is still underwater. This weekend, the Lofts Bay boat launch will be closed as that work continues. 
That's right there on the western edge of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Boaters are also being asked to just please avoid that entire area, which is east of Black Rock Bay. And here is what we know tonight about the plane crash victims. Again, Sean Fredrickson, his son and two stepchildren were in the seaplane, along with pilot Neil Lunt and one other person who has not yet been identified. Jay Colley and Kelly Krieger were in the Cessna and were on their way to Lewiston. Tom? In Spokane County, 46 new coronavirus cases reported today, including six new hospitalizations. No new deaths have been reported. 40 people have died since the pandemic hit, uh, hit Spokane, including one person who was in their 30s. Coming up in our 5 o'clock hour, we are also seeing an uptick in cases. Krem 2's Regina Ahn joins us now to explain how these numbers are increasing at a higher rate. Well, Tom, the number of cases in Idaho continues to con continues to rise. Looking at North Idaho today, the Panhandle Health District reporting 81 new coronavirus cases in the area and no new deaths. Most of these cases are coming from Kootenai County with 663 cases. That total number of cases reported since the pandemic hit is now at 770 confirmed cases. Kootenai Health still testing three to 400 people per day at its drive-by testing site. And yesterday, the wait times took over four hours with an influx of people that just continue to show up. So today, the time went down to just two hours. And coming up tonight at 5, our own Tim Pham will explain the recent uptick in cases and the progress on the Kootenai Health Testing Site. Live in the CBS room tonight, I'm Regina On. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Regina. Meanwhile, the Coeur d'Alene mayor is saying he would vote no to making masks a requirement for the city. Mayor Steve Widmer uh, issued a, a statement today saying, I strongly encourage the wearing of a mask when social distancing is not possible, but then goes on to say, that being said, I would not vote to mandate masks. He went on to explain that people need to be responsible and follow health guidelines. Right now, the Panhandle Health District Board is not currently enforcing masks, but says it may consider actions if necessary to protect the community's health. Nationwide, coronavirus cases are on the rise in several states. The death rate related to the virus has been low in parts of the country, and experts are still warning people to not let your guard down despite that data. As parts of the country see spikes in coronavirus cases, the death rate has so far remained much lower than previous months. President Trump recently touted this trend on Twitter. But is this actually a hopeful sign in the fight against the virus? These experts say we're not in the clear yet. Here's why these lower death rates might be misleading. First, deaths lag behind initial infections. What we've seen in the past few weeks is a changing in the epidemiology and a changing in the rate of deaths. You have to remember, however, that deaths are a lagging indicator, meaning that it takes some time for people to get sick, to get hospitalized, and then die from this. So you cannot look at deaths to get a snapshot of what's going on currently. Second, there are more young people getting infected. The virus has shifted from the older nursing home population to the younger, healthier population, which we know is less likely to die from the virus. So that could be one of the reasons the mortality rate is dropping. Increased testing also means we're identifying more non-fatal cases, making the percentage of fatal cases appear lower. The number of cases that we're diagnosing is actually going up. So we're doing more widespread testing. So that denominator or the number of active infections that we're diagnosing that could be asymptomatic is going up. So it makes that percentage look like it's actually going down. So while doctors do have a better understanding of how to treat the virus, just because the death rate has decreased doesn't necessarily mean we've made definitive progress in the fight against COVID-19. Plus, many experts believe these numbers will increase in the coming weeks following spikes in cases in many southern states. We really shouldn't be celebrating anything at this point. You can't look at the death rate now and say that this is not going to be something that changes or increases based on the number of cases and the hospitalization rates we're seeing in certain states. Well, jobless claims here in Washington appear to be slowly improving and getting resolved, although many people have still been waiting weeks, if not months, to get those unemployment benefits. The Washington Employment Security Department says that just under 35,000 people are waiting for resolution of their claims for benefits. Questions around their claims, though, should be resolved, we're told, by the end of the month. More than 1.2 million people have filed a claim for unemployment since early March, when the pandemic job losses began. More 
More than 883,000 people who did file initial claims, though, have been paid. Also, the CARES Act program that provides that additional $600 in weekly assistance, that is set to expire at the end of this month. And if you haven't filed your taxes yet, that deadline is also coming up soon. The original mid-April deadline was extended until July 15th, which is next Wednesday, and that was because of the coronavirus pandemic. So if you don't think you can file in time for that deadline, make sure you file for an extension that will get you until October 15th. Well, today, several employees and multiple groups here across the Spokane area teamed up to dedicate a Black Lives Matter mural here in Spokane. It's right uh, near Main Avenue. And take a look. It's employees from 14-4 uh, and 7-2 that kind of laid this groundwork. With the help of their families, the company is hoping this mural uh, on the 14-4 building will be part of a larger movement, both here in Spokane and across the country. Terrain Spokane says they've hired 16 locals who are either black or indigenous artists to help paint the mural and share their stories. This experience and this process and this project has allowed, has just brought a lot of peace to my heart. And I hope that it's doing the same for the artists involved. Again, I hope that it's doing the same for the black community here in Spokane. And I hope that it's doing the same for everyone who believes in the message. Um, and again, that it's making Spokane proud. Indeed, and the company hopes to have that mural finished up by July 19th. And I believe that every letter in that saying, Black Lives Matter, will each be different to reflect the different artists who are joining together for this mural.